It is the business of science to know what it does. We all use numbers, but where math chooses axioms, physics falsifies them. The two are diametrically opposed, and I give you three examples. The first is quasi-crystals. It has five-fold rotation symmetries which are forbidden, and quasi-periodic atomic order. The structure and diffraction are now completely solved and verified using the analytic metric. Secondly, quantum physics. Feynman famously claimed no one understands quantum mechanics, but failed to say what isn't understood is not physics. And thirdly, superconductivity. We shall discuss positive Hall coefficients and superconducting dynamics. In 1982, Shipman et al claimed long-range order with no translational symmetry. 24 years later, Seneca wrote a paper for the American Mathematical Society, What is a Quasi-Crystal?, which began, The short answer is no one knows. She was mistaken. I had discovered the special metric. The quasi-crystallographers make many assumptions, but we shall find that quasi-periodic crystals are hierarchic, have a special law of diffraction and a irrational order. And the major question is, how can the diffraction be arranged so that it is harmonic? In crystals, the diffraction obeys Bragg's law. N, the order, is integral, periodic and harmonic. Harmonic because of the rational fraction D over N. And the N is shown here 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, where odd orders are suppressed by structure factors. And the interplanar spacing D is unique at any Bragg condition and periodically repeating. Quasi crystals are different. The icosahedral hierarchic structure has obeys the quasi Bragg law, where the order N is geometric and irrational. Here it is, n equals 0, 1, tau, tau squared, tau cubed, tau to the fourth, tau is an irrational number. And uh, we shall see how the harmony ar arises in the following slides. Meanwhile, d, the interplanar spacing, is multiple and jumbled. So n and d falsify Bragg's law. But what we do know is these white dots map manganese because of its superior atomic scattering factors. And 10 unit cells in a circle are the projection of two planes in this icosahedral cluster. And five clusters are one plane of a supercluster. What you're looking at is a hierarchic structure of icosahedral cells which is extensible to infinity. To sum up, quasi-crystallographers choose six dimensions, which should not be multiplied without necessity. Choose Bragg's law, choose the lattice parameter. The editor of Acta Chris wrote, you don't measure A, you choose it. You, he went on, you cannot apply Bragg's law if you don't know how to handle D. Well, he doesn't know. He chooses A falsely. The law never applies. He is as rank six mainstream quasi-physics. We know better. The structure is hierarchic. Uh, with irrational orders, multiple Ds, and we shall discover how it becomes harmonic. The metric was numerically discovered by structure factors and then analysed to have exactly the same value by a completely independent method. We measure the lattice parameter A and verify it, and we find that the metric is due to the irrational part of irrational indices which harmonizes long and short ranges. Here are the indices in geometric series and we subtract from each index a semi-integer and the irrational residue is normalized with another Fibonacci sequence that we shall see in a moment. And the important fact is that the metric is the inverse of the metric function and they produce exactly the same answer but in completely, by completely independent methods. 
Look at the red waves. The upper red wave is displaced from the lower red wave by a tor squared. 0, 1, tor, tor squared, tor cubed, tor to the fourth, as in the diffraction pattern. And notice that the, uh, the red wave is commensurate at all main inter intercepts. Not only that, but locally commensurate as well. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. And furthermore, uh, let's compare it with the, the blue wave. The blue wave is a pseudo-Bragg wave, which is commensurate with the unit cell, but not commensurate with higher orders. But when we stretch the blue wave by the metric function, we get the red wave. And uh, it, uh, it has these properties of short-range and long-range harmony. But notice one further feature. 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, R is a Fibonacci series. And each Fibonacci number counts the number of cycles in the intercept. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's the denominator of the metric function. So let us sum up. Is there long range order? Yes, of course, that's evident in the diffraction. And is there no translational symmetry? On the contrary, hierarchic quasar block waves are invariant under all translations they taught to the air. Let's go on to quantum mechanics. We define it as the math of stationary states that are quantized. Why are they quantized? Because they're harmonic within bounds as in a Bohr atom or boundary as in a particle in a box or crystal edges. They interact unpredictably with creation and annihilation operators and with uncertainty limits described by Heisenberg. But notice that these stationary states do not apply to the electron in the electron microscope, which is unrestrained and anharmonic and is described by free wave packets. Like this. Here's the wave packet. And it obeys relativistic laws, which we transform into uh, wave functions. Omega squared is k squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth over h squared. And if we differentiate this, we get a very important result. The product of the phase velocity with the group velocity is equal to c squared. Here's the phase velocity. Here's the group velocity. In particles, they are different. And we go further and take the second derivative. The curvature is the inverse of the relativistic mass. And this is equal to acceleration divided by force following Newton's second law of motion. But notice before we go on, that Dirac and Heisenberg knew nothing about these velocities. They knew only the uh, Heisenberg's commutator, whatever that is. Here's the group velocity. It's exactly as Einstein calculated. It tends to C at high momentum k. And the relativistic mass, again, is exactly as Einstein calculated it. Uh, the uh, Phase velocity is faster than c and goes to extremes, tends to infinity as the wavelength gets very large. We'll apply these features as we go along. But notice that Heisenberg's limit is beyond even the extremes that are calculated in the 19th century by classical optics. It's not useful to experimenters because they need to know expected uncertainties, not arbitrary limits. We can uh, reflect. It's so obvious, isn't it, dispersion dynamics? How was it missed for a hundred years, appeared in no textbooks, but is now uniquely published by the Journal of Modern Physics with over 20,000 viewings and 10,000 do downloads and counting since the last count five years ago. I go on to superconductivity. There are two types of superconductor, low TC and high TC. The low TC have negative Hall coefficients, which are regular. The high TC have positive Hall coefficients. And the mathematicians say, oh, that's because they have holes. But the problem for you is, how does Lorentz magnetism act on voids or stationary ions? Well, it doesn't, and we need a better explanation. 
The Hall coefficient is measured by applying an electric field here in the vertical direction crossed with a magnetic field. And a free electron will be accelerated downwards by the electric field and as it gains speed deflected by the magnetic field. The result is the electrons build up on one side and produce a voltage drop across the quasi-crystal and a negative electric field. Positive ions behave in the opposite way. But the electrons in a high temperature superconductor have a positive Hall coefficient like the positive ions, but there are no positive ions that are free to move. So how does it happen? And we can easily see by dispersion dynamics how it happens. The second derivative is negative owing to the crystal fields in these particular materials. And the effect of mass is negative and the acceleration is negative. So the acceleration in the electric field was opposite to the free electron and uh, uh, the Hall coefficient was different. So what about dynamics? The strange thing is that owing to zero resistance, the electric field is zero. All physical properties appear to be zero. The magnetic field, the momentum because of Cooper pairs, the spin, even the charge. So what are the dynamics of a supercurrent? We measure it by uh, um, applying a voltage to these outer terminals and measuring the voltage across the inner, inner terminals. They're zero. Electric field is zero. But we measure a strong supercurrent. So there's a current crossing from one terminal to the other, which seems to have no forces, no momentum, no transport. What is happening? And the answer is again in dispersion dynamics. There's a macroscopic supercurrent with crossing between these two terminals. And the supercurrent has phase velocity close to infinity. And uh, what happens is the wave, when energy is supplied from the inner electrodes, the wave packet collapses approximately instantaneously with time close to zero in the time of a few cycles. So where are the dyna dynamics? They are absorbed by the mass of crystal like momentum in x-ray diffraction. Many other uh, calculations have been made based on dispersion dynamics. But one final reflection. Nature is much more consistent than mathematics. Einstein complained God does not play dice with nature. Mathematically, mathematics certainly does. Hawking considered this was a stubbornly persistent illusion. But then he propagated a theory of everything, the solution of nothing.